Thank you for downloading Season 5, Episode 18 of Baseball Pitching the Fix. I am your host, Joe Janish, and with me, as always, is baseball pitching motion expert, Angel Borelli. And as we have continued to do this offseason, we are helping the coaches and teaching the coaches how to think, which is uh, something that I think Angel has said before. So, Angel... We're going to get started this episode. We're going to be answering a lot of the questions that the coaches have been sending in. I guess they have a lot of idle time during these winter months. They're not, <laughs> they do have issues with some pitchers maybe not showing up in shape. They have some mechanical questions. They have some other questions. And we decided to uh, take a bunch of these questions because a lot of them were interesting and put them into one episode because we feel like these are questions that are on a lot of coaches' minds so, Angel, let's just start off with how are things going now with our first episode of 2019? How are things going this year? Everything's going great. And I'm really excited to dedicate this entire show to the coaches because I want to help you have your best season ever. And I'm here to answer your questions. And I've been getting so many interesting questions in the last month as you can feel the energy of baseball starting to increase again. So I'm really excited about doing this show. It's going to be great. And so I had some coaches that wrote in exercises, uh, wrote in questions, and it gave me the idea of reaching out to a few coaches that communicate with me frequently and ask them if they had any burning issues. Yeah, we've got some really cool topics that I think are relevant for everyone. Great. Uh, Well, Ben, before we go any further, we are not answering any questions about where Bryce Harper or... Manny Machado or Craig Kimbrell will land. But uh, other than that, uh, we should have some, you know, some resourceful answers here. <laughs> yes, we haven't become we haven't become mind readers yet, but <laughs> not yet. So I'm rooting for the Yankees, but I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So hopefully some of these answers will help you kick off your preseason. So Angel, let's start off with one of the first questions that you have had and what you want to talk about today. Yes, I actually got a really interesting text from Vince. He's one of my little favorite coaches here. And uh, oh, he's not little. He's a favorite coach of uh, mine in California. And I reached out to him. And it's funny when you read a text, you almost can get the feeling. So I'm not sure if I'm reading between the lines correctly. But so here we are in January. And he's writing a question, which you may say, well, why are we asking that now? It's January. His question was, and it was exactly stated like this, and it was in a text. One pet peeve of mine is, (laughs) when is it a good time for pitchers to shut down and rest? And he's got capital letters. And when do you say the body arm needs rest? And I said, this is an interesting question for him to ask right now. And then I said, no, it's actually a genius question to ask right now. So the first thing I thought was, I'm picturing a coach who had some pitchers show up and he's looking at them shaking their head like, what did you do in the off season? Something like that. Now, I'm just reading between the lines. But the reason why I personally love this question right now is coaches, you guys know you have to plan the whole year. And I know we have to plan ahead. And The way that you can evaluate if whatever you demanded of your pitchers or whatever you had them do or how much you left them on their own, you can evaluate right now if the decisions that you or they made for your pitchers actually were good. So if you have a lot of guys that showed up, I know high school, somehow the high school teams still practice under the name of travel teams, and I know college is already in. But if you have pitchers that show up and they are not looking great, and let's say they followed something you said, uh, or you handed something out and they did it or didn't do it, or they made the wrong decision and they, they played travel ball up until November and now they're showing up for you and they look tired, this is a great time for you to evaluate and to decide, you know, if you need to make changes in the, in how much rope you give them. Or if what you had them do or ways you answered their questions about what to do, if that was really good. And of course, you have to take this on an individual basis. But so this is a perfect time of the year. When you look at your pitchers, when they show up right now, they should be in a certain place that makes what you have to do in this busy time of the year easy. And if that's not the case, 
the way you want to look at how you're going to make decisions. On a in it, so if that's why Vince was asking this question, that right now he's frustrated because he's not sure the off season went correctly. There's your answer to that. That's how to fix it. But on a general level, and so when the pitchers are planning their seasons and parents, by the way, I had a call from a parent who said, I wish I'd known this. And it was with regard to planning out the year. It's pretty hard to talk baseball pitchers out of playing summer ball. So if you've got a normal pitcher who isn't injured and he's playing through the spring season, he's going to play summer ball. But the best time of the year when it's the easiest for everyone to handle is that after summer ball, and hopefully the summer ball ends in August, or at least one part of it, that he take the fall, September, October, November, up until the middle of November, to actually call that the off season. And I think we should stop calling it, you know, when do they shut down and rest? I think it should be called, when do they shut down and build? It should be the building season. The most important thing a pitcher has to do is to restore his arm first and then build it. During the season, you're constantly rebuilding it from the wear and tear it's getting in each game. But you have to have a building season. So if you have the ability to, during the fall, like take September, October, into the middle of November, they're weight training, strength training only. And then in November, they're going to, for four weeks, be three weeks flat ground throwing before they pitch. You can continue that strength training because the flat ground isn't as, you know, dangerous to the arm or as, you know, doesn't, it's not as intense for the arm. So you can keep training, down regulating the training a little in the upper body. And then there you are ready to go for preseason where you're starting to change the programs and then they're ready to pitch. So the ideal, Vince, is that you have that that September and October up until the middle of November and maybe even August. If you've got a pitcher who was so bad that he needs to work on his mechanics and you know he's going to have to start working sooner than November on his flat ground throwing, you shut him down right after the spring season, you tell him to build in the summer, and then he comes back and starts working on mechanics. What you don't want to do is work on mechanics at the end of the season in the summer then shut him down. And then when he picks up a ball, he forgets all the new stuff. So you want to couple any needs for mechanics in towards the uh, season, uh, the preseason. So anyway, that's my answer to the question. And Vince, I'm hoping that uh, your guys showed up in shape and I know you're a great coach. And if they're not, I feel sorry for them. So <laughs> anyway, there's the answer to that question. And yes, you don't want to be behind the eight ball. If you l- walk on the field and your arm's not fresh, That's not good because you can't get in front of it. You can't play catch up with an arm that starts out not in great shape. Yeah, that's that's good advice, Angel. You know, I I was thinking about that being a strange, a strange question for this time of year also. But then it occurred to me that something else that may have come up because we've talked about this in, in episodes in the past, pitchers who are going to things like showcases and things like that. So maybe they never did shut down because maybe they had a showcase over the Christmas holiday or something crazy like that. So it could also have come from that side of the fence, not necessarily how long ago they shut down or maybe they haven't yet shut down. Exactly. Exactly. So in any case, I think we have a few more questions. What's the next question on the agenda? So from another coach, another one of my favorite coaches, Steve here in California, He had a few questions about mechanics, and this is, of course, the time of the year and this month that you want to work, still be working on mechanics with your pitchers. So he writes in and says he ran into an interesting issue with one of his varsity pitchers, and it had to do with that when his front foot lands, uh, as he's doing the stride and his uh, left foot lands, he said that the foot is pointing to the left of the plate. So it's what we call externally rotated. It's pointed to the side diagonally. It's not straight. It's not turned in. It's turned outward. And he was thinking, he asked me, is this a problem with the uh, knee or is it the hips opening up too early? And so here's the uh, interesting thing about this. First of all, that's a very good catch on your part, Steve, that you were able to see that. And we don't want the foot, the you know, The feet should, in sports, act the same way they do in life. We're walking around all day. We walk around their feet pointing straight in. 
Now, if you've got a kid who played basketball his whole life, he's going to have his feet turned in, and that's not great. I mean, these days we teach kids to have their feet pointing straight. So the best way is that a, a foot be pointing straight ahead towards the catcher. That way his knee and his hip are going to be free to move normally. Remember, the foot is directed by the hip, okay? The foot and the knee is in the middle doing not much other than linking the two parts together. So when the foot's turned out, that is something you want to be concerned about because he's going to have trouble getting over his front leg. And also, it is a directional thing. And the left side of the body is the first part of the body that goes down the, the, the hill. So it's creating direction. But the issue with the front foot is there's a million reasons why that could be happening. So I'm going to educate all of you on how you actually look at an error like this. Once you notice it, You need to go back and look at another pitch, continue to watch it, and you need to notice if, if one, is the foot landing turned out, or is he landing like he looks like he's going to land straight, but once he puts more weight on the foot, the foot spins outward because he's on the ball of the foot when he landed. And it's very important to know if it is that, because that means when he transferred his weight into his front foot, he didn't have enough weight in it, so the foot was able to twist and move outward. So that's the first thing you have to determine. If the foot is landing outward, you need to, one, watch the pitcher walk back and forth from the mound and see if he walks that way, okay? Because then you've got a hip issue in the front leg. If he doesn't, then you have to look to see, is he turning into his landing and then just turning too far? In other words, the suggestion that Steve made, which which is, is this his hip? It can be the back hip that you're, that, and you see this in youth pitchers. Youth pitchers think you come off the back leg and you throw the ball. They don't realize that you're going downhill and you're remaining sideways and there's no rotation in your hips until the foot lands. So with youth pitchers, you'll see them just start turning immediately towards the plate. And in that case, when you're going downhill and turning at the same time, you're going to overturn. So the first thing is, is determine, is the foot moving into external rotation? Is he got a problem with his front leg, which you'll see when he walks? Or is he Uh, opening the back hip early, but absolutely the foot has to be landing straight. And the way that you deal with that is you put him at the bottom of the hill with his foot straight, and then you back up his back leg, you have him turn it against the rubber, and you say, this is where you need to be, and then you start working with that. But the biggest, most common reason for the foot ending up turned out, unless you're dealing with the youth pitcher, is that it is moving outward during the motion. And that's because he didn't transfer his weight all the way. So you're looking at stride length and you're looking at just his ability to move his hips over his foot. Wow. Cool question, huh? Yes. Yes. Another great question too. Do you have any, any question on that, Joe? Did that make sense to you? Yeah. You know, usually we see the opposite. Usually we see the the closed toe, not the overly open toe. When the foot comes down, just to clarify for everybody, should the pitcher be thinking about landing on the middle, the heel, the ball, the toes? Like what, mm-hmm. what, should, what should a pitcher be thinking about when he lands that foot on the ground? And here's a question from Coach Joe, my favorite <laughs> coach on the East Coast. <laughs> That's go. a great question. Ideally, because you want the, if you're keeping your leg underneath you the way we love, when the foot goes down, it goes down flat. Okay. But okay. there aren't a lot of pitchers that do that. We don't want to see the heel landing because that means he's decelerating and jarring the entire movement. We don't want to see that. You don't want to see the toe because that means he's not really going to have any control. So most of the time you're going to see the ball of the foot or you're going to see it go down flat. And that's what you're kind of aiming for. What you want to do is you want to look to see the way each pitcher does it and then see if it's working for him. But we don't want to see a heel because that means he's leading out with the toes up. And and by the way, if you see that, look at the way his ankle is at the top of his knee lift, because if he's doing that at the top of his knee lift, he'll just keep the foot in that position and stride out and land on the heel. But yes, you want to ideally flat or the ball, the foot, because the strength part of the foot is right where the shoelaces tie. 
those those bones in the middle of the foot are flat and they're long. And so you you want your weight to be in the middle of that foot when you at least start to turn. You know, when you land, your weight should be there. You should be committed to the front front leg. Actually, that's the deal with um, when the foot turns out during the motion. The body weight has to be committed to the front leg because the pitcher is going to make his rotation over that front axis of that hip uh, on the front leg. If he's not over the front leg, if he didn't commit his weight to the front leg, meaning his stride might be too long or he just doesn't know how to get his weight there, you're going to see a foot that moves because you're moving so fast, it's not stable. So that's a great question, Coach Joe. Well, thank you. That You made that a lot more clear. <laughs> and now I just, I just thought of a follow-up question. Okay. <laughs> as long as I'm asking questions too. And this may have nothing to do with the, the pitching motion, but it just occurred to me because you were, you were saying how, take a look at how the pitcher walks normally, do it, if his toes go out or in or mm-hmm. whatever. I also remember going to a running shoe store and trying to pick out the right shoes. The salesman mm-hmm. looking at the bottom of the sole of my shoes and saying, well, one side is more worn than the other. So it meant one thing or another. Is that something that comes into play as well? Well, if you're, that's why I say, you know, my background is in posture and alignment. So when I see something weird going on, although that's not weird in the sense that a lot of pitchers don't commit their way to the front leg, but if you see something and you're investigating it and you can't find this, the, 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 the solution, you do look at them walk. You may look at the, the, their turn, they're more on the outside of their foot, that something isn't balanced in their foot, but that can get pretty complicated. Normally, you're going to see it in the motion. The other thing I forgot to say, though, that you just reminded me of is when you've got a problem with the front foot and the way it lands, take a look at what's going on in the knee lift, because usually what's going to happen with the landing is created by the way the pitcher it looks in his knee lift and the way he leaves the back leg and the way he lowers the front leg and the position of the leg at that time. That is going to give you a lot, uh, some hints as to where you can find the cause. So what I like about this question that Steve asked, by the way, Steve, I'm giving you five stars here, is you're asking me for the cause of it. And you see, that's great. I love knowing that you're thinking that way because a lot of people think what they see is what they have to fix. So the foot is never the problem. It's the way he's landing into it or something about the motion, but you can't go beat up on the foot because that's not going to solve anything. So another great question, Joe. Yeah. So it's not the foot's fault. Yeah. It's not the foot's fault. <laughs> All right, not the foot's fault. What's Steve's next yeah. question? Yeah. So Steve's next question was, what, do you, what happens when a pitcher is late picking up the target? Usually eyes and head pointed downwards. Okay. This is one of my favorite topics because When pitchers come set, they all do something that helps them gather themselves. This is called coming set for a reason. They're not just setting their body, but they're and and setting that moment when they're they're getting ready to move. But it's where they each individually do something that's personal to them. And I learned this way back when I first started working with pitchers. So that's a very important moment for them. And sometimes the pitcher will look straight like the right-handed pitcher will just look straight like towards the third baseline. He's not, he hasn't turned his eyes towards the hitter yet. He's sort of gathering himself by looking down so that he has no, what he's really doing is he's not letting in any environmental or anything else. He's closing down his world. In sports psychology, we call it narrowing your bandwidth. So pitchers will come set, they'll come silent, they'll come inwards just to be able to have that second to gather themselves. So you want to, when you look at a pitcher who you notice he's not seeing the target or looking at it, you want to watch him carefully and see if you see him in that moment that he's gathering himself because you don't want to disrupt that. So I had a pitcher that flew in to see me and he was picking up the target very late, but I saw him always looking straight ahead. I said, listen, I want you to continue doing that. But when you have that moment where you go, okay, now I'm going to move, don't just lift your knee up, add in, turn your head, 
look at your target, and then lift your knee. He added that in very easily, and I've made that correction a million times. It is not good to be moving down the hill or turning your head to see the target as you're already in motion because, one, you are picking up the target late, and your eyes are, and this is the way you want to talk to your pitchers. You want to say that the the eye is a little computer and it's fee, it's feeding information automatically ahead of movement into your head and the eyes and the head are figuring out how to have your hand locate the ball in the place you want to put it. Now, if you are moving as your head is turning to see the target, you're not taking advantage of that because that all happens before you move. I mean, if, if you that's an amazing thing when you study motor control. When you think that you're going to go do something, your brain is already preparing your muscles to do it. You know, when you get up from the couch and say, oh, I'm going to go get a beer, it's already preparing the muscles with the right amount of uh, strength and everything to open the refrigerator door, grab the beer. It's an amazing machine. That's why you want to give it the information beforehand. So absolutely, they have to look at their target over their shoulder before they make their first move, but don't have it interrupt whatever they do. So if you, now a lot of guys, they don't have that moment. Well, then it's not going to be a big deal. You just say, look, come set, look over your shoulder or look over your shoulder as you're coming set and then move. But if you see the guy looking down, like Steve mentioned in his email, he's probably having a moment. Let him have that and say, okay, so now when you lift your head, instead of lifting your knee next, turn your head and then lift your knee and go. So it's very important to always respect the way that pitcher gets himself together because you can disrupt something. And that beginning part of the motion, you know, in, in, in graduate school, you have to analyze motion by detail by detail. And you have to come up with what the purpose of each phase is. And that phase in science is called the phase where the pitcher gathers himself. You'll see that word gather in science all the time. And it actually is a great word for it. So pay attention, see, see where you can add it in and have him add in turning his head first. By the way, he'll pitch so much better. And also, you know, a, a very good cue for pitchers is take your eyes to where you want to put the ball because the eye is going to direct the head. If their head's moving when they're moving downhill, the other problem is the head weighs 20 to 25 pounds. If it's moving, depending on how well he can move it as he's moving downhill, it can pull him way off to his glove side. So we want to have the head turn on top of the spine and then you head down the hill sideways. So there's my answer to the late uh, picking up the target issue. Huh. Unless you're Fernando Valenzuela, in which case you can look up at the sky <laughs> and ask for God's guidance toward home plate. Oh, nice. <laughs> or that Japanese pitcher that turned completely away and turned, he rotated all the way around. I can't remember his name, but he rotated all the way around uh, like a 180 and his back was to, and then he spun around. Oh. I mean, Japanese pitchers have an amazing way they deal with rotation. So we don't even go there to even question it or try to change it. But do you know who I'm talking about? He was on the scene about four years ago, I think. Yeah, there were, there were, uh, it, that seems to be a style among the Japanese pitchers. Gene Garber did it when back mm -hmm. in the 70s, Louis Tian. It's yeah. A, I don't know. It's a, it was a crazy thing that a lot yeah. of pitchers did back in the day, but um, yeah, we don't see it too much on, in the Western world. Well, obviously Steve was asking this question because this is a reason why pitchers miss their spots. I mean, when you've got a pitcher missing, uh, these are the kinds of details you want to look at. And Steve, I'm giving you five stars again on noticing this. I don't know if you work with film or not, but um, I know you coaches have, uh, I always tell you this, you've got great eyes. You see things that I could never see unless I have a camera. But uh, that's a great, uh, that's a great um, thing that you saw. And when you've got a pitcher that you're wondering, why is he missing? Go stand behind the catcher and see how soon he looks, you know, if, if he catches the, the target early. You can't believe in film when you see that a pitcher will head down the hill and turn his eyes way up, way down. He's not even looking when he's throwing. And this is a guy who had his head turned 
and he was looking when he started, but he looks away during the motion. And, and that this is probably the one thing that when I show pitchers that they're doing this, they'll see themselves at release. Their eyes will be completely somewhere else. And they look and they go, oh, no, they're shocked and they're upset. They don't know they're doing it. That's why catching something like this is great. Pitchers love these adjustments because they're so simple and they improve performance. Anytime you can improve performance without touching the pitcher's arm, you're in good shape as a coach. So he also had a third question, Joe. Well, I guess we could we can give him a third question. He's thinking. He's 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 thinking. Yeah, I love it. I told him. Well, actually, he's the one that gave me the idea when he sent these questions. I said, hey, let me do a whole podcast uh, and answer this correctly. So and another question he had is uh, he said, I am running into quite a bit right now, this problem. He said, he says, what is the correct glove arm path and action from balance point to stride foot contact? He said he's got a pitcher who, when he lands, his glove's completely under his arm. So yeah, and I'm a glove arm fanatic. And the glove, I always tell pitchers, the, the glove arm, the glove itself and the front foot should have a relationship. When the front foot lands, this is assuming that, uh, let's talk, I'm going to say this in terms of a glove arm that goes out straight. So the glove, the arm is straight, not one of these bent arm lifts. So it's easier for me to teach this concept if the pitcher lifts his arm up straight, which by the way, is probably the most efficient way to lift the glove arm, but it's not a a way that a lot of pitchers do it. But for teaching purposes, when the front foot lands and you've got that foot, which we know is pointing straight now, right, Steve? The glove is right above it and it has not turned over yet because you are still, you are just finishing the stride phase of the motion. The stride phase of the motion is a sideways phrase. In science, we call it the frontal plane phase. It is not a rotation phase. The rotation phase begins once the foot lands. So when you see the glove arm either already turned over or halfway bent, when the front foot lands, his glove arm is too fast. By the way, pitchers notoriously have glove arms that are too fast. And when you fix it, it solves most problems. And it takes away from velocity when it's not acting right. The guy who's got his arm, his glove under his armpit when his foot lands, his glove arm is either one, too fast or it's too fast because it's so short in the way he makes the motion that he just takes it, flips it around, and it's under his armpit. He never even extends it out and then pulls it. Remember, the closer the both arms look alike, the better off their timing's going to be. The jumping jack is the key movement if you want to understand the symmetry and the synchronization of the upper body to the lower body in pitching. And if you shorten up one arm while the back arm is long, then you're going to have a missed timing. And that glove arm will pull your side, will pull you around, and you will not be in the correct place at max external rotation. It's going to mess up the entire part of the motion. So another great question. But Steve, and to anybody else who's listening, on episode 11, of this season. And this would be some YouTube uh, videos that I had and photos on episode 11. If you go to the YouTube channel, Angel Brelly Pitching, you'll see a photo of, I think Daniel's there and there's some videos there too, but I think there's just a photo with the arm and the hand and everything's in that position that you're asking, where should it be? That's the where, where it should be. And so you'll be able to see it visually. So that's a great question, Steve. Does that make sense to you, Joe? Yeah, absolutely. And we've we've talked about the uh, the arms many times before uh, over the years, and uh, you know, I think we've always always talked about like the the two arms should kind of mirror each other. They yes. should kind of be like working in tandem. And oh, we don't see too many pitchers doing it. We would like to see more if we can get that glove arm out there and up. Mm-hmm. It kind of hides the ball a little longer too. So you don't need to do any crazy things to hide the ball. If if you just do things correctly, you'll be hiding the ball a little better. Mm-hmm. While you were talking about this, I had this mental image of uh, a pitcher for the Yankees from way back named Ron Guidry. And it, he he did it really well. He used to put his, his glove up and his, his other arm was where it was supposed to be. And he had a nice, nice landing. And he had to 
do it that way because he was about five foot nothing and about 150 pounds and he still could throw about 96 miles an hour. Mm-hmm. So he had to do everything right to get that kind of velocity. You know, I just was reminded when you said that. So Steve and to all you coaches, when you have glove arm problems, and I know we've talked about this before on, I don't even know if it's been this season, but you can't talk about pitching flaws too much. Glove arms are next to the knee lift, one of the biggest problems with pitchers mechanics. Well, when I say a problem, I mean, they're the cause of whatever problem is going on. So I'm like going, wow, could this be this simple? The glove arm, because it's their lead side and because they're not thinking about their glove arm, they let it do all kinds of weird things. They do weird things with the way the wrist bends. They do weird things about the way they put it out there. They lift up the elbow. They scoop it over. They push it out towards the baseline. They don't lift it up straight up like you would in doing a jumping jack. It's really crazy. It does something completely opposite of what the pitching arm might be doing. And remember, both arms are supposed to extend from the elbow downward, and they're both both supposed to come straight up. I mean, that is the most efficient way to move, but they come up with all these other ways of doing it. And if it's interfering with their motion, then it needs to be corrected. So one of, the, uh, one of my favorite things to do is to take their glove away. And I just have them hand break, you know, and, you know, of course, the catcher will bounce the ball back to them. But you just have them pitch without the glove and you see normal hands. You'll see them have usually a different arc to the motion and they'll get the feeling of pulling uh, the glove arm in correctly, which is done like you're doing a row. And when you do it correctly, it helps pull the uh, the pitching arm side around. And so it's going to increase velocity because rotation is created, is creating velocity. So when you have a problem with the glove arm, take the glove away and let them do some throwing without it and see what you see. And also look at the wrist and the way it, it's, uh, you know, is it doing something funky? It really, the wrist of the glove arm, it does things with its hand that we never see in life being done at all. <laughs> so it's a good place to start. But anyway, great questions. And uh, we're on to our last coach with questions. Angel, you know, all these questions are coming from California. Do we have any questions from outside California? We do. In fact, David from Ohio sent in some great questions. And these are on the field questions, coaches, for stuff that you need to know right now or you might not need to know, but you want to hear about. So uh, some of the issues. So one of the questions that he asked is, when you, he's doing, uh, he has his whole team doing my first pitch strike warm up program, which of course I love hearing. And he wants to know what else they should be doing to warm up the rest of their bodies prior to throwing. So it's hard to say each exercise and what they should do. And I'm not somebody who likes to tell people the exam. You know, I'm not an instructor. I'd much rather teach you concepts. So, coaches, this is probably the place where I see the biggest mistakes being made when I'm on a field which I'm on a field a lot because I use bullpens. I see teams showing up, play the high school team that I'm at, and I watch the way they warm up. And boy, you see a million different versions of things. Just to quickly remind you of concepts, because what you do before you play can make or break your performance in the game. Now, You may or may not believe that, but it is absolutely true. And if you watch elite athletes at the Olympics getting ready to run or to do whatever, they know exactly what to do so that at the time they need to peak, they will peak. So I hope I don't have to say this to any of my listeners because I know how smart you all are, but I'm hoping that there aren't schools that are still or teaching or letting teams do static stretching before they perform. So you never do everything you're going to do when you consider putting together a warm-up program for the lower body. Hopefully you're doing mine for the upper body. The lower body has to, in, has to not involve. These are the things that will ruin your game for you. So I'm going to give you the list of don't do this at home. Okay, one, static stretching, meaning you sit down on the ground, you put your leg out, you bend over to stretch your hamstring, and you hold it for 30 or 40 seconds. No holding stretches. Everything should be active. 
because it puts the muscle to sleep. And research has shown it takes about 45 minutes for that muscle to wake up. So you're already into the third inning. Okay, so no static stretching. Don't do anything that is going to accumulate lactic acid in any player's body. So you don't have them run where they get out of breath and then you have them run again and they haven't restored their breathing. So be careful about the distance you have them doing their drills. Now, you have a perfect layout. You've got your bases. They're 90 feet. So 90 feet is a really good distance to have them go. I see guys go from the baseline, the second baseline. They'll go all the way out past, no, excuse me, they're at the, they're at the third baseline. They'll go all the way past the second base, go all the way into the outfield because I'm over in the left field and I'm like, they're going way too far. They don't need to do that. Plus the brain is taking in information. Everything you do, if you can do it base to base. So when they run, don't have them run all the way across the field. Do not have them run around the field. Anything you do past 20 seconds is going to start to develop lactic acid. These guys are not lactic acid athletes. They're athletes that They don't have the systems to get rid of it. So don't create it at the beginning of practice. So have them stand on the third baseline, run to the second base, stop, recover a little bit, run back, have them do four to six of those, you know, especially your position players, but do not have them do things that take them into duration of performance. So if they're going to do like leg kicks or things that you've seen people do, karaoke, things like that. Have them do that only for the distance of the uh, 90 feet. That way, and don't, and have them settle at the baseline until they catch their breath. And since they only went that far, they're not going to take three minutes to catch their breath. And then you're going to have them warming up their insides, which is your first objective. Warm up the insides and have them do their upper body band work first, and then have them increase their body temperature with movements that are back and forth. Everything they do, you should see them moving, whether they're doing a hip swing or whatever. You don't do something where they just do one and they hold it. Everything should be moving. So any exercise you have that you think is a good one, you don't have them hold it. You have them bend down and they come up. You bend down, you come up. If It's something like that. You don't have them bend and hold, hold, hold because it's not good. So increase the body temperature. Use 90 feet as the marker for most things and work with them during this month and create a plan and say, guys, we're experimenting. Now, you've done your upper body and you would never do the upper body last because once their heat is is up, their temperature is up from your lower body warm up, you want to go right into practice. You don't want them to cool down by standing at the fence because the purpose of that that warm up is to heat them up and get them peaking. So what I suggest you do is you take all the guys. This is what I did when I designed one for the high school. Guys, we're going to experiment. So have them do one thing. So how do you feel right now? Okay, good. Anybody tired? Anything tight? Okay. They go, our hamstrings are hamstrings. So I created something. Does that work? One guy goes, well, this didn't work for me. And I go, well, try this. Okay, we added that in. So build it with the kids because they're the ones that have the tightness. And that's how you get a good lower body warm up going. So I hope that helps, David. And that's a great question. And it's the biggest mistake I see. If don't get your guys tired, don't slow down their muscles, and don't build lactic acid, which gets in the way of performance. Okay? Well, that's that's huge, by the way. But it's it's the biggest mistake. And listen, I'll tell you, when I see how sloppy the warm-ups look, if you want to be intimidating, get your guys organized. In fact, you know, pitchers that do my warm-up program, they go to the field, they hook up on the fence, they're doing this very organized warm-up. Parents would always be going to the kids' parents saying, what is your son doing over there? Because it looks so, when you look at it, you're like, wow, that's a classy warm-up. Have your guys look classy. That's intimidating. You know, it's intimidating when a team takes the field and they look organized. So I know your practices are organized. 
make sure that warm up's organized. David, I love that question because that's telling me that that's what you're looking for to get more organized. So now he's asking, he's got two more questions, great ones. This one, one of my faves. So he has said that he's been listening to the podcast, following, you know, USA Baseball Recovery Guidelines. He's having a great time with it because he says it's really helping him organize bullpens, et cetera. The problem he's having is how do you handle, handle a pitcher who's also a position player? He said his best three pitchers are his also third baseman, center fielder, and shortstop. He wants to know how to limit the throws. What does he do? How do you handle this? You know, this is a topic that, because of course, I don't want pitchers playing other positions, but you know, it's not the way it goes. I mean, you see in major league, they don't do that. But unfortunately, uh, David, you're not doing anything that, I mean, every other coach has to do it too. In high school, they play other positions. And, you know, and also too, the kid may be undecided as to which direction he's going to go in. And so if you've got a kid that's talented in two ways, you know, you want to use him because your job is to help this kid know who he is and to then, you know, pick something he wants to do. But the problem is when you've got another position is you've got to think of something that I'm not sure everyone thinks about. So if you've got a pitcher who is an outfielder, then this is a pitcher who has to do long-distance throwing. Now, we already know that long-distance throwing has an effect on a pitcher's arm before he pitches. But if you're going to use him as a center fielder, he's got to be able to throw long-distance. So when you're thinking about the roles that a pitcher has, you have to think about what he has to do to be in that position. When you've got a shortstop, he's going to be doing infield plays. He's not going to be, he'll be doing PFPs, but he'll be doing infield work as well. So you've got to think about what the arm's going through with that. So you're not just thinking about when do I play him or how, what order do I play him in? First, think about what are the skills he needs to be this position? What are the skills he needs to be this position? Your third baseman needs to throw at least 126 feet. Okay, because if he has to go across to first, then he's got to be able, that's the greatest distance he needs. So you've got a pitcher who's a shortstop who's going to have to do a lot of infield plays along with the other guys. The third baseman that has to throw 126 feet, and same thing for the shortstop. The outfielder who's got to throw, I don't know how many feet, how many feet, I mean, Joe, they're out there, do some guys out there throw all the way to the plate, right? Or do they throw to a cutoff? Man, it's still long distance, right? Yeah, you're talking at least, you know, 150 yeah. to 200 feet, sure. Yeah, and, 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 and plus, you wouldn't say, oh, he's always going to throw to a cutoff, man. You take him to the distance that would be the ideal thing. I mean, you know, so you're going to be, he's going to, he's training as an outfielder. So, and he's got to do bullpen. So you've got to think about those things. It, you've got to think about it carefully. Okay, now, with that being said, what, the, here's the way that you want to think about how do you make decisions about everything. So that's why it, it's better for me to teach concepts. And it's even when I think about the answer to this, it's difficult. And you have to go to some set of values that you have or philosophies that you have. You create those first and then you go to making the individual decisions. So I go to, well, what do we know about pitching injuries? Because we know, and this is what coaches sometimes use as an excuse to have a pitcher be in a different million different roles. Oh, well, he doesn't get that many balls. The guy in the outfield is not going to throw that much. Or, you know, but and we know third base and shortstop get the most, right? So like that, that it's not going to work there. But you want to think about not just the roles they play, but what it takes to prepare for that position, which I just uh, listed. But also you want to understand the different challenges that go on for a pitcher and the different rate of injury. So you don't hear about shortstops and outfielders and third basemen having injuries. In fact, I can't even remember. I mean, unless they're not in the news, but you know, it's unless it's a sliding injury or something, pitchers are the ones getting injured. The number one cause of injuries for pitchers is pitching with a fatigued arm. Now that's the truth. 
that's not just me. That's the medical world says that. ASMI says that. We know that to be true. So when you're deciding or asking yourself, geez, should I put him in as a shortstop first before he pitches or should I have him be a shortstop after he pitches? If you believe what I just said, the answer is made for you. Is it ideal that when he pitches, he has to go in as a shortstop or a third baseman? No. Is it ideal that he has to go in as a center fielder? That's even worse, believe it or not, and I'll explain that in a minute. But given that you have to do this, we have to deal with reality, and that's what I deal with. I have to find solutions for you guys to help you. So, and here's the thing that you might sound that might sound shocking. If you're putting a shortstop in after he pitches, let's say he's somebody you put in for a few innings, he needs to start right away. Once the arm starts to go into recovery, he is going to be in trouble when he tries to warm it up again to play, which he'll he won't do. He'll just go in. You're better off putting him in. You might intuitively say, oh, well, I'm going to give him some rest and then put him in. No, put him in when his arm is at least warm because he hasn't gone into recovery yet. And even though he may be tired, he's not tired for the role that really causes the injuries, but he's at least hot enough and warm enough to where the tissue is more pliable. So you would take him out, put him in, then you're handled. The guy in the outfield, he worries me because he's going to be cooling down out there, right? He might stand out there for and never get a ball for four innings, five innings. He, if he picks up a ball and has to throw it suddenly, and he's been out there and his arm is already going into recovery, then he's going to be in trouble. So remember these little details about when the body's warm and hot, it's going to actually be more pliable. So he's going to be less apt to have an injury if he's making a shortstop play. If he's tired from being a shortstop and then he starts to pitch, you're going to have a fatigue pitcher and he's set up for injury. So this is why I mean you have to understand some concepts because you're dealing with a very, very unusual and complicated situation. So I wish there were more clear answers to tell you, but that's the way to do it. And also in terms of limiting throws, absolutely. I'm sure you guys are organized enough to have your rotation. When you know your pitcher's a starter on a certain day, then you should hopefully be able to say, well, maybe he could be a shortstop on this day. Always know that when the arm's in recovery, like you might say, well, he's pitching today. I won't use him till tomorrow. No, once he started recovery, in fact, the the time when his arm is most beat up is late, late on the next day and then the second day after that. That's when we see markers for the arms the most disrupted. It's actually not that disrupted right after pitching. The next morning, it's starting to show some signs. But later that day, like you guys, if you've ever done a hard leg workout, you wake up the next morning and go, oh, I'm cool. And then 28 hours after your workout, you can't walk. 28 hours is when proteins start to make changes, et cetera, complicated stuff. So don't go, oh, he's pitching today. I'll shortstop him tomorrow. No. Probably that's not a great way to do it. If you could give him the two days and then put him in on the third day, and then maybe he's pitching again on the weekend, awesome. Awesome. Now you've got a plan going. But if you can do any kind of planning like that. So the rules you want to remember are the hotter the body, put him in before he goes into recovery. Second, don't have him pitching as a precision skill. Never have him tired for a precision skill, plus he'll get injured. And third is, Always know that the recovery for his arm is the most important thing because he'll, the next time he pitches, he won't be as good. That recovery really becomes sensitive about 28 hours after performance. So that next day, I mean, don't be planning it that way. Try to give him those days in between, particularly if he's one of your starters. This way, you're going to have the best of all the 
you've got a problematic situation, but at least you're making some conscious decisions. And you know what? After ro- rotating a few weeks through making these decisions like this, you'll start to get a feel for uh, what has to happen. So I hope that answered that question. What do you think? It's complicated, huh? It, it's complicated, but, it, you know, it's a all too common situation that a lot of coaches out there, specifically high school coaches and younger, because your your very best athlete with the strongest arm is almost always going to be both a pitcher and a shortstop, mm-hmm. unless he's left-handed, in which case you're probably putting him in center field. So, mm-hmm. you know, it's it's a very difficult dilemma for those coaches. Yeah. And unfortunately, I had the worst situation when I was in high school. I was a catcher and a pitcher. So when I got off the mound, I would go behind the plate, which we know is the absolute worst thing you can do. So, but, you know, if even that was a situation, which we don't want to do, maybe you just say, all right, he's just going to pitch today and that's it. But even then it's difficult because Mm -hmm. when you take your best athlete off the field, you're also taking him out of the lineup. So you might want to figure out a way to get your shortstop to also play first base, maybe. I mean, I don't know. Yeah. You know, there isn't, there isn't any other place on the field I can think of where you're probably not going to make too many throws. Well, my, I, well, when when you've got the three best pitchers in these three positions, obviously these guys are best for those positions. This is a coach who cares, and uh, he's dealing with the, the best situation. I mean, he's putting them where they need to be and just trying to figure out how to work around it. Now, the ideal thing when you're playing two contrasting positions is to, on, the, on one weekend, not play the other position. I mean, if you can you know, if somebody's a shortstop on a weekend and then he's a pitcher in the middle of the week and he's a shortstop on the weekend, I mean, that's one way around it. That's ideal. But unfortunately, my guess is, even though he didn't talk about this, my guess is, because this is how most things go, they're, they're in each game. You know, they're not sitting out for any games at all. So yeah, it's, a, it's definitely a conundrum. But you start with those basic rules And you also have to be very, very observant as to the performance and where you're going to see the performance decrement is on the mound. Now, I dealt with a very good pitcher who was also a shortstop. He ended up having to give it up in his junior year because of his draft potential. And when he had that first season without it, he could not believe the difference in his arm. He said, I didn't realize I was never fresh when I went to the mound. Those were his exact words. And I said, wow. And I already knew it, but when he was brought to me, he was already a star shortstop as well. And, you know, I won't, actually, I don't take on pitchers. I don't work with pitchers that are in uh, other uh, positions because the work I do is too demanding with them. And putting me on top of shortstop and pitching actually is deleterious to the coach. So I turn down the client and tell the parent if your son should choose someday to be just a pitcher. And I don't want to tell you how usually within a year they're at my door. I mean, you know, they, they've made the decision, particularly because the pitcher started having injuries and feeling fatigued. And It's just that pitching is a strain on the arm. It needs recovery. And anytime you're doing another skill, you're not recovering. So it is a a conundrum. We do have to deal with it. And so coaches, when you're in this situation, do a great job of observing. If all of a sudden he's not going the distance, he's a starter. If all of a sudden his velocity is dropping, if all of a sudden you see him missing, that isn't him being a bad pitcher. That's him having a fatigued arm and his hand's not where he thinks it is because his shoulder is worn out. Be very careful. And also, if you have a pitcher that's a shortstop, make sure he doesn't look like a shortstop on the mound. That's the problem with the different throwing style that catchers and shortstops have. They'll have that ball near their ear. They'll end up leading with the elbow because the shortstop position is such a quick position that that position gets embedded in their nervous system. So when you've got a position where there's no style of throwing the ball, well, I mean, you know what I'm saying. Their job is to use their feet to get to the ball, get the ball off to whoever they have to get it to. So they may be sidearm, underhand, whatever. That gets embedded in the nervous system in a very special way. And that's a gift to be able to do that. 
So they take that and they bring it to the mound. Very unusual to see a shortstop that can go, okay, now I'm a pitcher. Now I'm not going to bring the ball near my ear. Now I'm going to go into external rotation fully. They look more like a shortstop, which can really injure them. So when you've got that kind of competing thing, you want to look to see, is this okay on him? Is he, is this affecting him? And I hope that you don't have to sit and go, wow, you know what? That it's really affecting him where you have to get stuck and make a decision about how you're going to use him. But that is another thing to watch for. So have an insurance policy, do some very sensitive observation of the kid and have the conversation. If you see a shortstop throwing like a shortstop on the mound, you need to have a conversation and let him know he's got to learn there's two different styles and work with him on that. And once he gets that, he'll be good and he'll love that he had that adjustment. But don't let him pitch on the mound like a shortstop because he will end up with a labrum tear and that's not going to be good. So yeah, I know it's, it's complicated. This is why major leagues don't do it. <laughs> this is why the higher up you go, it's too, it's, uh, there's too much liability. That's why you know I don't work with uh, the liability situation, not because I'm worried about uh, It's not me I'm taking care of. It's, it's not good for him. And if it's not good for him, it's not good for me. Right. And plus, when a pitcher has got those kinds of positions, he's, he gets pretty tired. He's a ball player that's doing more than one thing. So, But anyway, uh, David had one last interesting question okay. that I thought, think some of you will enjoy. So he said that um, he is used to, he said, he, I think he used to be a pitcher, but he's been in baseball a long time. And he said that in his day, you know, pitchers would put jackets on between innings. Right. He said they wanted to keep the uh, temperature warm in their shoulder. So they put a jacket on. And he said, and this is his exact words, kids today look at me like I'm from outer space when I su- <laughs> suggest this. <laughs> Showing your age. Yeah. I think it's funny. Yeah, it is. Yes. <laughs> I guess it's like having an A-track or something. Or stirrups. God, I wonder how many of the audience don't know what an A-track is. <laughs> That's yeah. scary. A but, tape. I know, really a cassette tape. But anyway, so I think this is a really interesting question, but this is how I answer the question of when pitchers ask me, should I ice after pitching or shouldn't I? Well, that's actually got a little more detailed answer to it. But first, you want to invest first. The pitcher who doesn't want to put a jacket on is probably a pitcher who is overheated because his body type is the type that gets really, really warm. There are a number of different body types. For men, there's three different body types. For women, there's four. And one body type gets really, really overheated. He's built differently. You'll see him a lot on a football team. And they get heated very because they've got glands that are operating at a different rate than other people. Then you've got the tall, lean, racehorse kind of guy. His temp- body temperature runs different, just like the way people digest food, the way people can eat and not gain weight. This is all metabolic. And, you know, pitchers are human beings. So the pitcher who's getting overheated, he's wanting to cool down a little so he can go in for the next inning. Putting a jacket on doesn't sound good to him. If the jacket is thrown over just his shoulder, which I've seen a million times, then that might be a better option. But if he is not wanting to become warm, it means he's already warm or too warm. Okay, so that's the first thing. You've got to understand the pitcher and you might want to educate them and say, we know that we don't want tissue to cool down in the middle of performance. So if you want to know if you are someone who should either put on a jacket or throw it over just the shoulder, let it hang off of there, then this is the way you would evaluate it. When you go back out to throw, does your arm feel stiff? If it feels stiff, it means it started to cool down. This is, by the way, the exact issue I was bringing up with uh, taking a pitcher off the mound and putting him in as a shortstop. You don't want to wait six innings, okay, because he's going to be stiff and cooling down. So you want to talk to your guys, uh, give them a lecture from outer space, and tell them 
that the reason why you're always questioning them is because we know that muscles perform better at a certain temperature and you don't want that temperature to change. If you're overheated and need to relax a little, cool. But if when you go out to the mound, you feel stiff, you either one have to do some movement stuff. And you know, the first part of the first pitch strike warm up program is designed those little arm the first movement you do, there's no band involved, there's no fence involved, you just move in your arms. That is the entire pitching motion being done. My guys use that in between innings when it's been too long. Most of my guys I'd never see with jackets on either when the, the few times I'm around the dugout during a game. So, of course, we're in California. So that first grouping of exercises with the arm circles, et cetera, Tell them, hey, if you start getting stiff, do one or two of those or the whole thing. And they do it in like six seconds and it keeps the juices warm inside the joints. So that's an option. But I also think you need to educate them and then let them decide. But if someone says, you know, put on a jacket and they don't want to, that means because they're seeing it is making them uncomfortable. And what they're responding to is that their whole body is hot. They're hot. Their system is too warm. And they're trying to cool down their entire system. They're not just thinking about their arm. So make sure you educate them. And then that's the way you would deal with it. Things about heat and coolness like ice is a very personal thing. There's no research that said ice is going to help. There's no research that says ice will hurt. But what we know is that to heal, we want blood. So icing after little injuries to the fibers might not be a good idea. We also know that if you're overheated, and you don't want to put a blanket on, that's because you're too, your system's too hot and it doesn't want to be warm. So it's very personal when someone wants to either ice something or warm something up, and you want to always investigate them and teach them how to know if they're making the right choice. And that's the best way to go with that issue. Yeah, the whole uh, jackets on the pitchers issue, I think a part of that too could be the geography. I mean, I know playing and coaching in the Northeast United States in games that were in early March. You want a jacket. I think everybody on the team wants a jacket on, not just the pitcher. It's uh, it's just too darn cold. I mean, sometimes it's in the low 30s when you're playing a baseball game. So it's, mm-hmm. I think it just go with what you say is just uh, do what's comfortable for you and it's a personal decision. Yeah, and you know what? Thank you for reminding me because, uh, David, I wasn't uh, – Uh, thoroughly connecting the dots on your location. But what I said still stands. I think that you want to educate them about how to know if they're making the right decision or not, that muscles need to perform. They need to be heated to do that. And if it starts to cool down, it can make them feel stiff. So if their first few throws feel uncomfortable, like when the catcher is up, You know, like if they go out and they have the catcher up and they do a few throws and then he does the catcher down, if their arm is getting stiff in between, tell them they either need to keep it warm or have them do that first, you know, say, I want every pitcher to do this two or three times when you're sitting between innings as needed. Once they start to understand why you're asking that question and the importance of it and how to detect if they need it or not, they'll they'll follow instructions. Pitchers love stuff that helps them. But yes, I know that outer space look very well. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I, I want to, uh, generational. <laughs> right. And I want to apologize to the coaches out there on behalf of Angel. Sometimes she forgets that baseball is played outside of California. <laughs> right. Oh, are there other states? Oh, I didn't know that. <laughs> well, we are our own country. You know that, right? <laughs> yes, that's clear. All right. So I think that's all of the questions that we have, but I think we had a comment from one of our favorite coaches, Larry Owens, who recently was at the American Baseball Coaches Conference, the ABCA conference that happens every year in January. And Angel, why don't you tell us what Larry said to you about what he was experiencing at the conference? Yeah, not so much what he was experiencing, but coming back from the conference, and he and I talk all the time, and we talk about the fact that, you know, Baseball's going in the direction of data. The Oakland A's owner was saying this year is going to be about keeping guys healthy and it's going to be data driven. Those were his exact words. Teams are are bringing in, you know, they started bringing in biomechanists, which is data. 
It's a, a quantitative analysis, not what I do, qualitative. Right. They started bringing in spin rate experts. You know they've got all this stuff going on with the trajectory of the ball off the bat. There's all this data going around, and it's getting even more common. And teams are very open to spending money on this, and they're using it to make decisions about things. And of course, I, you know, data is part of science, but in my world, the world that I'm in, the qualitative world, I'm reading data all the time. I'm reading research all the time. I'm reading statistics all the time. It's the first thing I have to look at when I'm reading something to see, well, do they measure this correctly? It's how I'm able to deliver information to you that I know is accurate. If you knew how much science I didn't deliver to you because I didn't think it was accurate, you'd be amazed. So not all science, you know, research, research articles can be interpreted in many different ways. But anyway, we were discussing the role that data plays. And I was saying something to him about that, you know, I think data, data has got to turn, there's got to be another step after it because human problems require human solutions. So if you're getting data that something's wrong with a pitcher, his spin rate's going down and it goes down in the fourth inning every, every game. You don't want to just be saying, well, what's wrong with this guy? You've got to figure out why is his performance going down. And you're not going to figure it out by looking at numbers. Somebody's going to have to look at the pitcher himself. But we were discussing that aspect. And he said something that I hear him say all the time. And I love when I talk to Larry because he's got so much knowledge. And everything that comes out of his mouth is so down to earth and real. And he said, and he said something to me. And then when he knew I was doing this podcast, he said, you know what? I want you to remind your audience of this one thing. Baseball pitching is about getting outs. And he said, you've got to get players and coaches to try not to lose sight of that. And I absolutely love that because I don't care how much data you get or whatever's happening. And even like when I was saying to in answering the questions, observe your pitchers. Is he getting outs? You know, if your shortstop pitcher isn't getting outs all of a sudden, you might have to rethink, what am I doing? Because his goal is to get out. You don't want anything to interfere with that. You don't want his mechanics to interfere with it. You don't want your rotation or the way you're playing him to interfere with it. You, The goal of pitching is to get out. And we were we we both consistently talk about we want to make sure that we stay with the things that are tangible. So we can take the data, which has a role for sure, and we can take the biomechanical research, which has a role. I mean, it has a role for setting standards for me. But when you only have numbers and you have things that don't actually, you can't actually look at the pitcher and say the one thing to him and make that one adjustment that's going to make him better, you can lose sight of what the real purpose is. He's got to get out. He's got to release that ball. Everything's about the way he releases that ball. He's got to release that ball to where he gets that ball to go where he wants it to go. And we don't want to ever lose sight of that when we're making decisions about should we do use this technique or should we listen to this data? You want to be sure that you're always taking the pitcher into consideration and that what his real job is. You know, a chapter in my graduate thesis was putting the pitcher back into the pitch. That title came to me after working in baseball. By the time I got my master's, I knew that that was going to be my role is to always put the pitcher first, not the pitching, the pitcher. And now more than ever, that title is relevant. Now more than ever, that title is relevant. So that's our message from our wise friend to the show, Larry. Thanks, Larry. Yeah. Thank you, Larry. And thank you, coach, for downloading the show. I, I, you know, we've uh, gone a little over an hour now, but I think that it was all really good information. And Angel, I want to thank you so much for sharing your knowledge and answering the questions that our coaches sent in. Yes. And listen, coaches, keep them coming. Keep them coming. I'm here to help. Yeah. If you have a question for Angel, just send an email to angel at gymscience.com. You can find more information about Angel and what she does with pitchers at gymscience.com. That's G-Y-M-S-C-I-E-N-C-E.com. That's about all we have for today. Uh, We'll be with you again in about three or four weeks during this off season. 
And in the meantime, we want to wish you safe and effective performance on the pitching mound. <laughs>